All right, so we're going to tackle this top reaction. This is something that, <laughs> a reaction that we actually learned in, in um, part one. But I want to spend a little bit of time on it. Let me see if I can cut out what I need. Come on, let's see. All right, so so this is an example. We learned this reaction in part one. This is actually an example of epoxidation. Followed by epoxide opening. And the, the opening part is uh, where we're gonna spend a little, uh, few minutes. Let me turn my hotspot on because this is this is dragging. All these devices switched over. Give me one second. Are we learning this oxidation reaction in part one and organic one? Right? Hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide. Not sure if y'all did that in lab um, or not, but what 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 would those reagents do? This is the one reaction out of this um, reaction wheel where it's the alkene that's targeted and not the alcohol. So what would this reaction, the first reaction, do to that uh, to the alkene? And again, this is not a new reaction, right? This is a reaction that was learned in part one. What is an epoxide? Let's, let, let me go ask that question. Like when the, that looks like a triangle with O. Come on. Yeah, like a, we'll call it a cyclic, cyclic ether. So it's uh, yeah. just yes, yes, yes. So this is my epoxide. I like that description, a triangle with an O. I like that. Uh, it's a three-member ether, right? It's an ether because it's got a carbon on either side of this oxygen, right? And it's, it's cyclic, meaning that it's a three-member ring. All right, so it's a, it's a three-member Cyclic ether, and this is a again, this is a reaction that was taught in part one. All right, so that so that's the first part of that process. <laughs> in the second part, which happens here, right? Sodium methoxide is a nucleophile, so this is Na plus and then OCH three. minus, right? So the reason why this matters is because when you when you use a nucleophile, and this is not trivial, by the way, uh, epoxides, are, they look like they should be unstable because it's a three-membered ring, but they are notoriously uh, stable, which is a good thing if, if you need it as a functional group, you know, as a and a part of a larger molecule that you're making, but yeah, they're very stable uh, unless you heat them up, right? I, I had a, uh, a guy that I worked with as a grad student. He was making epoxides, and one of the steps at the end of most reactions, you have to evaporate off the solvent so you can isolate your product. And he was using a rotary evaporator. He heated up the water bath a little bit too hot and it exploded in his face. Uh, if he hadn't had his goggles on, he probably would be blind like right now because he had cuts. His lip was cut, top lip was cut in half, had cuts all over his face. But anyway, uh, they're, they're pretty stable if you, as long as you don't heat, overheat them. All right, so when I take an epoxide, 
and I treat it with a nucleophile, it's going to follow one or two pathways. If I just do it like this with nothing except the nucleophile and, and, and some solvent, right, that methoxy group is just going to come in and pop this open here. And I think this was in the uh, one of the videos that was sent out too about epoxide opening and how and how, what conditions allow you to do selective epoxide. <laughs> so this is coming here. Right. And then on the other carbon and the epoxide, you have your oxygen, right? And then of course, you're gonna, you're gonna quench this. We've talked about quenching before. You just add in some source of H plus, and then you, you're able to quench that uh, epoxide opening product. Right. So when, when you do epoxide opening, if you do it like we have shown up top, and I'll just give a generic example down here. If you do it under neutral conditions, and let's just say this is my epoxide. I'm not going to use the one that we had up top. And I add a nuclear file to that. It's going to go to the It's going to open on the least substituted side. So on the neutral conditions Epoxide opens at the least substituted side. All right, so you add a nucleophile and then you add some uh, proton source in to quench that um, oxy anion. So you end up here. Like so, right? If you if you do this under acidic conditions, right? Will you will you add in a, a proton source first to activate your epoxide? The regiochemistry changes. So under acidic conditions, the regiochemistry is going to be reversed. <sighs> Bless you. Thank you. So I'm gonna take that same epoxide. And then I'm gonna treat it first with H plus, not last, right? And so obviously th this is gonna do proton transfer with that uh, proton source. So I'll have an intermediate that looks like this. That's positive. And it's just CH3 here, right? So now when my nucleophile comes in, it's going to attack this carbon instead. So you get different regiochemistry based on your conditions, right? And the re that's a reason why it attacks that carbon. If you think about what would happen if you broke the carbon oxygen bond first, either on this side or on this side, <laughs> that this carbon right here will give you a let me just circle it. It will give you a more stable carbocation if this happened in a stepwise manner. All 
carbon. So if that bond was to break, that carbon is more likely to be uh, positive than the other carbon. So it, depending on the conditions, your, your mechanism is either gonna be governed by sterics or is either gonna be governed by electronics. So in this case, this is governed by electronics. In other words, the, the charge on the carbon and the electrophilicity of the carbon is going to dictate where uh, oxygen, where the nucleophile attacks, I'm sorry. All right, so you end up with, in, in this case, this as your product. All right, and you can see immediately that the OH is on a, on a different side, right? So when you do epoxide opening, you can selectively open at one side or the other based on the conditions. So you can do it uh, under acidic conditions and you can add to the more substituted side, or you can do it under neutral conditions and you can add to the least substituted side. So this is, let me put this in here. All right, so let's go, let's keep moving unless there are questions about that epoxidation. Again, all of the stuff that we're doing, none the reactions are new, but none of the other stuff is new. We learned nucleophiles and electrophiles in part one. We learned about um, these different reactions, some of them like epoxidation and things like that in part one. We learned about dipoles, partial charges, all that stuff was from part one. We learned functional groups in part one. This section, again, if you struggle with identifying functional groups, you're also gonna struggle with the reactions because if I say that you're gonna convert something into a, sp a specific type of functional group and you don't know what that functional group is, then it's not gonna make, none of the rest of it is gonna make any sense. So my suggestion is to go back and refresh yourself on those functional groups. Uh, if you have trouble remembering them, because that's like, you need that, right? That's, a, that's your foundation for everything else. All right, let's go to the next question. This is just a, a question where you have to fill in the arrows. And what type of reaction is this? Look at the product and tell somebody tell me what type of reaction this is based on this product right here. What functional group is this? Is it the en enemy synthesis? Enemy synthesis? Yeah, it's an amine. It's not an enamine. An enamine <laughs> will have a double bond here, but it is an amine, right? Or shifts base. So let's go through and let's have someone do this. Put the arrows in. Let me put some electrons in so we can keep track of this stuff. All right. Anybody want to take a stab at that? Uh, putting the arrows in for that. Um. Can I try? Go ahead. I need Thank you for the practice. volunteering. Thank you for your courage. Okay. Stepping up to the plate. Okay. Let's try. Be mm -hmm. um, just do it. So the first step is, oh wait, hold on. Okay, so the first step you have to take that. And then, yes. um, oh, and then this. Mm -hmm. Because and anytime then, you, anytime you um, attack a pi system, you have to break the pi bond. Right. Good. Um, and then after you do that, it's in me. So there has to be some type of proton transfer. Right. So look at this intermediate. Right. And the okay. arrow. Sorry. I don't know why that happened. The arrow is going to here. Right. right. So that's your next that's your next product. So then you 
which one did they use? So I'm gonna just do this one. Good. And and then that take those hydrogens back. I mean that those electrons back into here. Good. Excellent. Excellent. Um, what else we got? Uh, so now we gotta go from here to here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was proton transfer. And then what's after proton transfer? Is it elimination, right? No, look at where you, so so this, what you just did, got you to here. Oh, I need now to do another one. there to here. I got to do another one. Yes. Okay, so then I got to go like that. And then brings that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's an ugly Perfect. arrow. Perfect. That's okay. I, I got it. I understand it. Um, and then we got to get rid of that uh, water. water. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can trying? do it. You got a you you got a ripe situation, perfect situation to eliminate. You got an excellent leaving group, and you got a neighbor that does not want to be negative. Right? right. Right. So all you're trying to do now is put the pie bomb between carbon and nitrogen. Put the pi bond between carbon and nitrogen. Mm -hmm. That's the final product. Do you see where the N is double bonded? Yeah. This is where I got stuck last time. Hold on. Okay. So get rid of, okay. How did, how did we get rid of the water molecule? Um, oh, you want to lose water, right? Yeah. That's what I'm trying to do. So, so I have that, to. Break the CO bond. You can break that. And give those electrons to oxygen. This one right here. Like this. Yes. That one? Yep. Okay, no. but then after I do that, I have to make that double bond to the nitrogen, right? Mm -hmm. So don't don't you have uh what you need? All you need is a pair of electrons to make a double bond. So then that okay. So then I don't know which way the arrow goes. You want to put the put the double bond. I'm gonna zoom. Well, I'm, if I zoom in, your arrows are gonna be all over the place. You want to put the double bond right here, right? Yeah. So do I? Oh, can I just break it? Oh wait, hold on. Let me hold on. Okay. So would I just go like this, and then like, hold on. My name is in the way. Like this? Can I do that? Uh, no, no. Okay. This is not radical. Put, put the arrow for oxygen, for water leaving on the other side of the bond. You had the right arrow in the first time. Just move it to the other side. Okay. So I'm trying to so erase put it on the outside of the bond. This side? Yeah. Yes. Now, you got a long parallel nitrogen. Mm -hmm. Turn it into a pi bond. Just put it between the carbon and the nitrogen, and that's, that'll complete that elimination. Yes. Got you. Remember who 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 can tell me uh what that's called when you have a atom or a functional group that's able to push out a leaving group like that? It's Anybody remember? NGP. It's neighboring group participation. NGP. Yeah, and and that that's what's happening here, right? All I need to do is make that pi bond, and in order to make it, I have what I need. I got a pair of electrons on nitrogen that I can put between carbon and nitrogen and at the same time force out the water leaving group. Oh, I said I wasn't gonna zoom and I did it anyway. <laughs> Look at that, why well, I tell you what, that's close enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it'll be that plus. That H2. Plus water, right? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a type of dehydration reaction. This is good though. I think I screwed up somewhere though, because your arrow's down here and now I messed up. Hold up. I'm gonna put them in before I post the notes anyway. Okay. Oh, I need to zoom out. That's the problem. Yeah, there we go. Now we're good. All right. So yeah, that's that's good. That's good. And again. Anytime you add to a carbonyl, it's going to follow the same paradigm. You're going to attack the carbonyl carbon with some nucleophile. You're going to get to a tetrahedral intermediate, and that intermediate is going to be where your product is going to come from. It's either going to do some other process 
proton transfer, elimination, something in order to get to the product. All right, thank you for doing that. Um, no problem. All right, let's go to the next question. <laughs> next question. And you can go ahead and clear the screen. I'm, I'll put those arrows back in before I post the notes. All right, appreciate it, appreciate it. Excellent, excellent work, by the way. All right, let's go to this question. What type of reaction is this? Number one, number two, what's the product? Acetyl formation. Say again? Acetyl acetal formation. Excellent. You're absolutely right. How do you how did you know that? Besides the fact that you've been studying. <laughs> well, or did you just guess? I don't think you guessed. Oh, yeah, right there. Huh? It says it right there. Oh, okay, 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 I got you. Like we got two modes of an alcohol. Yes, yes. That's that's what I was looking for you to say. I didn't even realize that. <laughs> but you got two modes of alcohol, and you ha you have that in the presence of a ketone, right? So that's going to give you an acetal. So two moles of alcohol with a ketone or aldehyde. It's going to give you acetal. <laughs> what if I took that same alcohol and, and did that in the presence of an ester? What would I get? Uh, not an ester. A car gave it away. A carboxylic acid, not an ester. I'm sorry. Would you get an ester? Yes. You would get an ester. ester application. All right. So which of these products over here is an acetal? First of all, what can we rule out? Let's let's go by process of elimination. Because even if you don't know the mechanism and how to put the arrows in and all that stuff, you should at, at a minimum, you need to be able to predict the products at a minimum. I know the mechanisms can get you know, get hairy, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and it can be a lot to remember, especially in the amount of time that we've been working on that, but you, you, you should at least be able to pick out the product. So what, what is not, what can we rule out? Would you rule out four? Cause it doesn't have an oxygen. It doesn't have anything, right? That's a, a product of a totally different reaction. So that's not, not the product, right? What about, uh, what else can we rule out? Could you rule out two? Yes. Two, look at the difference, what changed. Product two put a carbonyl on that carbon. And that's, those are not the conditions to do that. That's, that. That is a reaction that's possible, but it's not possible here. All right, so you got two moles of alcohol, you're trying to make an acetal, your answer, it's going to be either one or three, right? But what's the problem with three? It only has one in oxygen. Oh, yeah, okay. it only three only accounts for one of the uh, alkoxy groups. And remember, when you're doing acetal formation or hemiacetal formation. If you go back and look at that mechanism that we did, it's the, this is what we call the alkoxy functional group, right? It's the alkoxy part of the alcohol that actually adds into that carbonyl, right? So this only accounts for one. But you need two because your stoichiometry dictates that you have two, right? There's a two here. So that means you got two equivalents of that compared to your start material. So the correct answer has to be one because now you can see both ethoxy groups are accounted for. All right, this is, and again, I can't stress it enough. If you haven't made flashcards because we've only covered it, I gave you the, the, uh, 
handout, the initial handout in four quadrants on purpose. So you can use those to make your flashcards. Not necessarily that, but just the reactions and everything is classified by type, right? The sterification was first, oxidation to carbonyls of alcohols to carbonyls was second, reactions of carbonyls was third, and then uh, amines and reactions of amines was fourth. So you can, I did it all of it. Nothing that I do is by happenstance. That's on purpose. Because if you classify the reactions, it makes it easier to, uh, to remember like the processes. Right, but if you just got a million things and, and, and it's all over the place at random, then it's difficult to um, categorize everything. So that's why we do it that way. Anyway, let's go to the next question. Uh, yeah, let's do this one. So it's telling you right here that it's a Gabriel synthesis. What is Gabriel synthesis? What does that do? If you have the handout in front of you, all you do is look in the fourth quadrant and look for look at the reactions of amines, and you should be able to tell me that. You get a pathalamide plus an alkylide, and you get a primary amine. Yeah, so you can get a primary or a secondary amine. And you can look right here. You can see the amine product from that first reaction, all right? So this is kind of a retrosynthesis. So if the if the amine is here, what did I start with? I have thalamate right here. I have thalamate. I got my sodium hydroxide and water to pop the ring open at the end. So what what other start material do I need? The alkyl halide. The alkyl halide. Right, wherever the nitrogen is, right, that's where the halogen should be in your alkyl halide, your star material. So over here, I'm going to put in any, well, not any halide. I'm going to use bromine. All right, so that's my star material. I have an alkyl halide. I have thalamate. And I'm and then I'm going to react that together. Remember, it's a, like, like a SN2 type substitution, where the thalamate is a nucleophile and it attacks the carbon where the alkyl halide is. And you can probably uh, gather from this why you wouldn't make tertiary, why you can't make tertiary amines this way, uh, because a tertiary alkyl halide is probably in the presence of thalamate, it's probably going to end up doing elimination as opposed to uh, substitution, right? You're probably gonna end up with a, an elimination product. All right, but let, so now let's go to the next step. Remember mag sulfate is a desiccant and I'm just gonna put up here. That it removes water. So what do I, what are my reagents here now? Let's, let's, Talk about that part. I have a primary amine and I have a ketone in the presence of mag sulfate. What reaction is that? What reaction is this? We got a primary amine in the presence of ketone. What did we just do? We made the amine, is that right? Yes. So if we go here, the primary amine and, and the ketone, we're gonna get the same reaction. This is, again, these are clues you look for. If I have an amine in the presence of a carbonyl group like a ketone or an aldehyde, right? That, that is going to give me a shift space. What is it going to look like? 
Like, what's the product going to look like? What is the overall outcome of making an ME or shift space? Don't, don't think about the arrows. Just think about what happens. All right, don't we just replace this oxygen with the nitrogen of the amine? I mean, that's the that's the core of that reaction, right? So this is this will become in what I got on there. Like that, right? Anytime you're doing shift-based synthesis, just like we talked about with the vid, the nitrogen of the amine that's you know involved in the reaction is going to lose, lose both of if it's a primary amine, it's going to lose both hydrogens and it's going to end up replacing the oxygen of the carbonyl. So it's that plus water. And the mag sulfate we talked about the other day, that's going to soak up the water that's produced as a result of the reaction. And then as it soaks up water, it's gonna force the forward process to go even, it's gonna increase the rate of the forward process because of Le Chatelier's principle. All right, let's go to, um, Let's go to the next question, unless there are questions about that. So in the next question, it says that that's an epoxide opening. Somebody give me the product for this reaction. Where is that going to open the epoxide and what's the product going to look like? For the epoxide opening, so with the the Na, I mean, yeah, with the NaOCH three, wouldn't that replace? Once it opens up, it would replace the oxygen, or it would. Or no, it's not going to replace it. It's going to attack one of the two carbons in the in the uh, epoxide. Oh, sorry about that. So it's going to attack here. Is that right? Why didn't? Why am I not attacking the other side? What are the conditions to make it a, to make it selectively attack the more substituted side? You did it in an acidic solution. Yes, and this this is under neutral conditions, not acidic conditions. All right. So that epoxide is going to where the product is going to look like. Is and then we got a uh, carbon here, it's OCH3 that attacked. And then on this carbon, it's an O. And let's just say, let me put this in OH. These are my two epoxide carbons right here. And that's how that's, how that's going to open. It's just going to attack the, the less substituted. All I'm doing is adding a nucleophile to that epoxide. What about the other side? This has a H plus step, so LAH, we've seen this before. All right, it's a source of All right, it's a hydride source. Hydride is a very powerful nucleophile. Uh, normally you would use like LAH or uh, sodium borohydride uh, or something like that. And this, these things are very highly reactive. Uh, I remember doing a reaction with LAH as a grad student and I had never worked with it. And at the end, when I went to quench it, man, I put some, I added the water in too rapidly and boy, it was a wrap. That stuff was everywhere. But that's the life of a grad student. You screw up and learn from your mistakes. 
So what what would the product look like from that? I'm gonna copy this one. If if H minus or the hydride is my nucleophile, what would the product look like? Would it be similar in instead of the OCH3, you will have L I A L? Hold up. Let me, let me uh, paste it in. So you want you you, you don't your nucleophile is no longer methoxy, right? So that's not going to be the case. But the, the lithium, let me show you what that looks like. So this is aluminum tetrahydride, right? Here. And this is negative, right? And then the lithium is just a counter ion. So the lithium is not gonna, gonna be a part of the, of the product. It's, let me just make one of these a different color. It's the hydrogen that's gonna be um, your nucleophile. So this is basically gonna give rise to this. So that's what's gonna attack. That's just going to attack here, right? So this ends up being a, let me write the hydrogens out, because it's a C, it was a CH2 prior to the epoxide being open, right? So that hydride just ends up here, like that. Right, because over here, this is a, this uh, carbon right here, just a CH2. So I'm just adding a hydro, another hydrogen to it to pop it open. All right, so lithium aluminum hydride is a source of H minus. I can't remember which part of the video that's in, but I know it's in one of the last videos that I sent out. It's a, it's a hydride source. All right, we're not gonna, we won't have time to do the acetal formation. We can do that Wednesday for this one, because that's our mechanisms. I'm gonna leave this because we've already covered aromatics. So I'm gonna have you do that one yourself. Um, let's see. Let's see if we can get through a couple of these right here. We'll come back up to the acetal mechanism and the Vedic mechanism. All right, let's do, um, let's start here. So we have a potassium permanganate and then methanol. What is potassium permanganate going to do to the alcohol functional group, a primary alcohol? Don't all speak out at once. You might break the internet. Yeah, it makes a double bond. Oh, hello. Is it gonna is it gonna oxidize that up to a carbon to a carboxylic acid? Yes. Right. This is a this is the oxidation part. Right, and then if does I does it also that, go through like trans esterification or is that oh never yes. mind that's yes. right there. That's the second step. Right, so eventually this is going to become, and these are two separate reactions, by the way. So you will have to run the oxidation and then purify that so you can isolate your uh, acid and then you take the acid and just do the esterification. Right, and again, when you do a esterification, it's the alkoxy portion of the alcohol Right, that's going to replace the hydroxyl group. So the final product will be the ester. All right, let's do, uh, got a minute. I think we can do this in a minute. Let's do this reaction right here. What reaction is that? 
you have a strong base followed by an alkyl halide in the presence of an alcohol. A vitamin, wait, no. Now, you, you're right in the sense of thinking about a base and an alcohol halide, but what's missing for a bitty? Aldehyde or ketone? And triphenylphosphine, right? You don't have that. Wait. Yeah. So what would this be? What What is sodium hydroxide going to do to that OH proton? This is Williamson ether. Is it gonna deprotonate it? Yes. And then that oxygen that we just made into a better nucleophile This is after the first step, I'm going to put plus H2O and then sodium here, right? That oxygen then will attack that alcohol halide. That's what the, right? So then your final product will look like this. like that. This is the ether part right here. All right, we got an oxygen and two carbons on either side of that oxygen bound with a single bond. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna keep pushing through this. You need to be on these reactions every day, a little bit a day. I promise you, it's not gonna come by osmosis. It's not gonna come by putting the hand out under the pillow. It's gonna come by reps and work. So we're gonna uh, pick this back up on Wednesday, God willing. And uh, yeah, I'll see y'all then. Thank you. Thank right. you. Right. Have a good day. Thank you too.